Hello everyone and welcome to another video. I know with it being now the end of September and going into October, a lot of people are thinking about buying a snowmobile. And in many cases, it's gonna end up being a used sled, especially if you're looking for a first sled. In many cases, that's a used sled. I have worked on sleds for a long time. I've done a ton of checkovers and a ton ton of repairs. In fact, on these M8s, you could have them in a million pieces on the floor and I could put them back together, not a problem. But that doesn't matter because in today's video, what we are going to be doing, you and I together, is we are going to be going to buy a used sled together. All you're going to need for that is a flashlight. You're not going to need anything else. You're not going to need any special tools. Uh, you're just going to need that flashlight. I'm going to make this video simple enough that anyone could be doing this. Even if you've never even been on a snowmobile before, if you've never ridden one, if you're just trying to get into the sport now, I'm going to make this video easy enough that you can identify all the parts on the sled. I'll be doing that as we go through this snowmobile. Actually, we'll be going through both of these M8s back here. I'll be bouncing back and forth on both of them because even though they're just within a few years of each other, five years of each other, they're actually configured very differently. And this video will go the same for all sleds. Sleds are built all very, very similarly. So if it goes for a cat, it'll go for Skidoo, it'll go for Polaris. Um, this is a video to help you buy your used sled, to know what to look for and to not get screwed over. So before you go look at your sled, the first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is do a little research on that sled. Go into the forums, read a little bit. I know forums aren't always the best source for information. Sometimes there's a lot of contradicting information. Sometimes you even have to separate out the BS from the fact, but you will see a common trend on an issue that this one sled, this one model or this one make is having, and at least then you know to look for it. So after you do that, Grab a flashlight because it's going to be the only tool that you're going to need to check over these sleds. Next is consider bringing a friend with you. Uh, it's not a bad thing to have a second set of eyes on the machine, especially if maybe your friend knows a little more than you. Uh, it's not harmful to have a second set of eyes there to just help you pick things out. One of the things that I've noticed that people don't tell you is actually you're probably not going to catch every little thing wrong with this sled when you go to uh, check it over to buy it. So what we're going to concentrate on is let's catch the big things, let's catch what's important. And from there we can do our little repairs or whatever we think is necessary to get that sled operational again. That's our goal, catch the big, important, expensive, deal-breaking things. So we have our flashlight. I'm going to be the friend that is going to help you look over this sled. Our goal is to catch whatever we can with it to at least know what the deal is on this unit. And I will help you do all that from bumper to bumper, motor, track, we will go over everything and you're just gonna need your flashlight. Today, we're gonna go over this 2019 Arctic Cat Hardcore. Now this sled is a mountain sled, but everything that we're gonna be checking over on this machine today, you'll be able to directly uh, interchange with a trail sled, uh, a utility sled, everything is going to be the exact same pretty much. So anything that I teach you on this thing, you'll be able to put on any snowmobile because everything is built so similarly. Um, any brand, it's all gonna be the same. So let's start with this machine here. So first off, we're gonna start by just having a look at this sled, like just have a walk around. We're gonna check the body out. Uh, it's a little bit dirty, so you can't really see how scratched it is, but you know, chances are if you're buying a used sled, it's going to be a little scratched anyway, unless it was really well taken care of. So we're just going to have a quick look at everything. We're going to look at the bumper. We're going to look at the windshield, side panels. We're going to have a quick look at the skis. We're going to look at the seat. We're going to make sure that there's no rips or tears in it. Go down to the tunnel. Just going to make sure that they're, we're, we're looking for things that are obvious. So we're looking for anything that's really bent. If there's a big dent in the tunnel, if there's a big dent in the rear bumper, we're starting by looking over the body. None, none of that is broken. Come on over to this side. And down here we can catch that the running boards are just a little bit uh, accordioned up here. Not a big concern at all. We're gonna keep going. Look at this side of the seat. Have a quick look up here. We'll be checking into that stuff in a little more detail in a little bit, but we're gonna see if this thing has any big obvious signs of having been crashed. So we have a little bit of, little bit of plastic damage here, which is near the clutch. 
Uh, so we're gonna check that out once we get in there. We're gonna make sure that there's nothing damaged in the clutch, but a little bit of plastic damage, no big deal at all. Now, while we are checking for body stuff on these cats and actually most units, the air intake is up top. There's also in the bottom as well, there is a frog skin, which is this material here. It's called frog skin. Um, it lets air in, but not moisture. Moisture will beat on top of this, but you wanna make sure that there are no holes in these frog skins. If there is a big hole right here, um, you could actually be looking at a motor that's either cratered or about to crater. I have seen these actually been ripped and destroy engines before because of so much snow ingestion, especially on a mountain sled. If you pile a bunch of snow into there, it will get sucked in through the intake, which is actually in the front in this one, and into the throttle bodies and directly into the motor, and it will dry your cylinders, and it could be a bad time. I've seen it take out motors before, so make sure that the intake vents are intact fully. We're gonna look at it from a little far away and we're gonna make sure that the tunnel is not completely bent or anything like that. So we can see just from this far back that it's not twisted, it's not warped, it's very straight. We can also check for the straightness of the steering post standing back a little bit. We can check the handlebars that they're not bent. Uh, we can actually see a little bit if we stand back from this machine. So we looked over this machine and we didn't really find anything with the body that's really too obvious. The next step, we are going to be starting at the front and we're gonna be working our way to the back. So we're gonna start now with skis, suspension and steering. We'll just start at the very front of the unit. So we'll start at the ski. So what we're gonna check for here is that any way that it's obviously bent, um, in a lot of cases you can bend these, uh, these plastic skis back into shape, but we're looking at that one, it looks nice and straight. Look at the other one, it looks nice and straight as well. If it has a powder coated spindle, this is the spindle right here. We're gonna look for any signs of obvious cracking uh, in the powder coating, because if we see some cracking in the powder coating, it could indicate that this spindle is bent. Um, not all spindles are powder coated, so this is something that uh, we, we, we can look for on these cats, but um, if it's just a bare aluminum spindle, just look for any signs of stress. We can go up here and we can check the uh, we can check the A arms. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna point this out. These cats do have a natural little little bit of a bend in the A arms. That's kind of just how they're shaped. So just be aware of that for these. If we're gonna look for any big bending. Uh, we're going to check out the shock. We're gonna make sure, this is a really easy way to tell if something's bent. So even if the A-arms look straight, maybe there's something bent in the bulkhead or the mounts. And here's a great way to check that. If this machine is sitting flat on the ground, we can check for the gap between the A-arm and the shock. Now I can stick my whole hand in the gap here and I can pretty much feel that my knuckle is pressed right up against the spring, just kind of snugly. Now let's hop over to the other side and we're gonna check the gap again between the shock and the upper A-arm and feel, just doing a preliminary feel on it, the gap is the same. Now if we saw that the gap on this was half the size, it would be obvious that something is bent in the A-arm, something is maybe bent in the chassis and on this model we can visibly see the tabs for the upper A arms. So we can uh, then determine if maybe something is bent. Maybe we don't know what it is bent, but if the gap is hugely different between the shock and the A arm, and there may be other places you can check it too, depending on your sled. If we can see a big gap there, then we know something's up, something's bent. And if the A arms don't look bent, then you could have bigger problems in your suspension module or your bulkhead. Um, and that's something we really wanna watch out for because it means it's probably been crashed pretty hard. You can see on this A-arm, this one has also got a, a, a manufacturing curve toward it. That's just how these M's are made. I'm gonna just hop over to the other sled here because this one is a little more easy to see, this gap here. So it's a little tighter because this sled is configured completely differently. So I can't even get uh, a finger up in that gap. And now we're gonna check the other side because this will tell us if maybe something is bent. But again, on this side, I cannot get a finger through that gap. So we know that the gap is the same. 
Now on this ski, on this M8, we can see that the rubber is completely destroyed. It's sticking out both the front and the back, and that ski dampener will now need to be replaced. Fairly cheap, fairly easy to do. So that is something that would be uh, a, very, a very minor repair, but it's something we wanna be aware about. Now we're still checking steering, so we're gonna hop up on the machine here, and we're just gonna have a look and see if it's obvious that one ski is sticking out further than the other. I have seen this before, and it ended up uh, being a completely bent chassis because one ski was sticking out probably an inch further than the other one. So if we see that one of the skis is actually further forward or further back, we can also determine that something is bent and it's probably gonna be in the chassis if you're not seeing any really obvious signs of bending in the A-arms. Next, what we're gonna do, if you can, if it isn't a hugely heavy uh, utility sled, like something like really heavy, like a Bearcat or something like that, we're gonna tip the sled up on its side and we are going to continue checking the body and the steering. So the reason that we want to bring it up on its side, if we can, is because we can see a lot more. We have the opportunity to check a lot more things. So again, we are going to start at the front. Now, these skegs, this is a skeg. The carbide is completely gone. I will go over to that machine over there and I will show you what a good skeg and carbide look like. But the ones on these skis are completely gone. The wear bar is worn right flat. It should be at least this size, if not larger, and you can see it has worn completely flat. It is a wear part, they're easy to replace, It's they're fairly cheap if you don't want to get one with a carbide, uh, but we're that's, that's good. We have lifted this sled up, make sure that there's no holes in the ski. If these are to the point that they are beyond the metal, you can actually burn a hole right in the ski, and I've seen it lots of times. And from here, we can also have a look at the other ski, and it's the same case on that side. And it's just a simple repair that is cheap and very easy to do. We now have the hardcore tipped up on its side and I can show you what a good set of wear bars look like. So these are wear bar or skeg, uh, whichever you prefer. And let's, let's make something clear. Carbide, skeg. Carbide, skeg. Hardened metal, regular steel. Now, if this carbide is a little bit rounded, that's okay. If it's a little bit flat, that's okay too. If it's gone, that's also okay. As long as the wear bar actually has some life left in it, as long as it's not really flat. There's a lot of people, especially in the rental industry, who will take these uh, carbided skags right off and they will proceed to put on uh, just a regular set of skags because they're easier on decks. Uh, they won't steer as well in the really hard snow or the ice, but they will steer just fine. So if this little carbide here, which is that right there, if that's worn flat or if it's gone altogether, but there's still lots of life left on the wear bar, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Since this thing is now on its side, we can have a good look at the exhaust port. We can have a good look at the skid plate and the underbelly, as well as a good look at, in this particular unit, the heat exchanger is up front. We're gonna make sure that there's no huge dents in the fins or even holes in the fins or even coolant leaking down the exchanger, because that does happen. On other models, um, such as Polaris and Dew mountain sleds, the heat exchanger actually runs all the way back here, but we don't have to worry about that on this machine because it has a small heat exchanger. But in other units, you would check back here for any holes or any large leakage in the heat exchanger because it will go all the way up and under the tunnel. And you can actually see at the very end there, uh, the rest of that heat exchanger. So you can have a good look on its side. You can get a lot of things uh, looked at. Now, ideally you would have like a stand or something. And I do have a stand in the back that you'd actually be able to um, lift the back of this track up on. But since we do not have that available or you may not have that available, tipping it on its side is just as good to check out everything in the skid and the track, which is what we're just about to do now. We're gonna check out everything in the skid and the track at this point. We have our flashlight here again, and we can have a good look at everything. So everything that is a part of this chassis, this uh, is called a rear arm, uh, this is called a rail, and uh, this is called a Hyfax, that metal strip, or that, sorry, that plastic strip on the bottom, and everything that is metal or plastic in here, is called a skid. That is part of the skid assembly. The, everything in there is the skid assembly minus the track. 
So first off here, we're just gonna make sure everything is in good shape and not bent or broken. This is a skid mount. We just wanna make sure that there's no um, accordion, uh, accordioning around that. That is good. This is the rear skid mount. We're just gonna make sure the same thing, that all these brackets are straight. And then we're gonna have a look inside the skid itself. So the front arm, which is this piece right here that mounts to the tunnel, we're gonna have a look around here. We're gonna make sure that nothing's bent, nothing's broken. Have a look at the limiter straps. These are the limiter straps. Uh, they control how far the front of your skid is allowed to dive into the track. They also control the uh, ski weight, believe it or not. And I have that in another video if you wanna learn about those. Um, so we're gonna have a look here. This on the very bottom here, this is, a this is a slide rail end cap at the very front. And then behind that, and it goes along the whole length of the entire skid is called a high fax. So on this machine, we can actually see on the cats, they have a couple of different wear lines on them. So we wanna make sure that the top wear line isn't being um, worn right down to. Like th this, these high facts have no wear on them and neither do that other M8. So I can't really show you what a wear set look like. Generally when they wear, they will wear fastest uh, up here where the track is brought along the bottom of the skid. But we can see that these high facts are not worn down anywhere. So we're, we're all good there. Obviously you'll want to check the one, uh, the high facts on the other side and make sure that it's not worn right down either. So we'll keep working our way back on the skid. We're gonna check that there isn't any obviously bend uh, shocks. We're gonna make sure that there isn't obvious bends in these uh, axle braces because often if we find bends in these braces, these uh, aluminum tubes here, we can pretty quickly infer that the rails are bent and we can check for that as well. If you really wanna be thorough and check for straightness you of the, uh, of the rails, you can actually use these um, holes in the track and you can check down the whole length of the rail and the camera doesn't show it really great, but uh, you can check down the whole length of that rail and make sure that there isn't any big obvious curves or anything in it. And that's great to do while it's on its side. Cause if you have one rail bent, you probably have two rails bent. So while we were down here, we're also able to check out, these are idler wheels. We're just gonna make sure that um, they're moving smoothly, that they are not bent or warped or cracked or worse. We're also on this one, able to move this idler wheel. We will not be able to move this idler wheel because it carries so much track tension on it. If you have a trail machine or a utility machine, you could be looking at, you know, upwards of, you know, 10 or more idler wheels across the whole skid. Or I've seen skids with probably almost 20 idler wheels in them. Let's talk about the track and drivers now. Pretty much for the drivers, all we're going to want to do is just make sure that the teeth are lined up with each other. And you can see that this tooth is in time with the tooth on the bottom. And that's exactly what we want to see. We will be checking um, running of them in a moment. Um, now we want to move on to the track. And believe it or not, the first thing you want to check on the track is this slide rail end cap. If this slide rail end cap is missing or it's worn so far down that metal is exposed, there is a chance that the track may have taken a dive into the skid. I've seen these missing. I've seen them worn right down to the point where they will peel off uh, these track clips. And th these can be reclipped. I have reclipped these tracks before. Um, but it's something you wanna watch out for because if that dives hard enough into the track, if this is missing, you could have a big wrecked track. But since we have it on the side, we can, besides what's in the drivers, we can inspect pretty much this entire track. Not every uh, track window has a clip on it. I just want to note that on this track. Some do, some don't. If you notice a pattern that's suddenly out of pattern all of a sudden, then you could be missing a uh, track clip. And this track is very new. It is a power claw track, so it is a very tough track. And say if we were missing a lug, if we're missing a lug, that's, it's not the end of the world. If this lug was say cut off right here and all the way down, not the end of the world at all. A track could be missing. I've, I've seen many tracks missing multiple lugs. It's no big deal. Uh, when it becomes a big deal is when these lugs tear off. And then you, can, you start to see this sort of material 
right here inside of the, uh, the track surface. That's when the track becomes basically compromised. Um, I have seen entire uh, clip windows being um, completely broken out before. You can still get around with it, but when those drivers go to hook into one of these windows, it is going to put an incredible amount of stress on that track and um, it could fail. So you wanna watch out for that. A missing lug or two, as long as you're not exposing any of this material, it's not a big deal. As long as you just, if, you, if it was just cut right here and you just see rubber behind it and no, uh, none of this, I guess, um, fiber and none of this fiber stuff, it's not a big deal. That track is not compromised. You are good to keep riding on it. We have the sled back on its feet now and we are going to continue to check things because there are more things to check. And I'm being very thorough in this video, but making sure that it's easy enough that uh, pretty much anyone can do this check over. Having said that, if you're dropping say $10,000 on a somewhat new snowmobile, you're gonna wanna check these things. You're gonna wanna have peace of mind that, okay, at least I know that this stuff is good. Before we start the sled up though, we are gonna check a few more things. So at this point, we're gonna move on to the engine bay. So what we're going to do next, we are going to be taking off the side panels and on an older machine. You may be taking off uh, the hood entirely, but on this machine, we are not going to be taking off the hood. We're starting on the clutch side. At this point, we're gonna have a visual inspection of the clutches. If we were to see a bunch of white powder uh, a bunch, just like a bunch of white residue on either of these clutches or on the exhaust pipe. It definitely likes to collect. That is corrosion. Um, I have seen corrosion destroy clutches and actually age a sled far faster than it ever should have aged. And what that's from is actually carrying it down the highway on salty roads without a cover. Use your cover. It prevents the sled from aging. It prevents from salt and road debris getting in all these places and causing corrosion, especially in the clutches. If you see a bunch of rust and stuff everywhere, that is definitely from um, highwaying the snowmobile without a cover on it. But we're gonna wanna check for more than just corrosion. So we're gonna want to just have a look at the clutch and make sure that there's no obvious cracking. Many of them can be dirty. Um, ideally, we for a full inspection, we'd be removing this clutch. Obviously, you're not gonna be able to do that in most cases. So we are going to also be running this up uh, with this clutch panel off, and we're just gonna make sure that these are shifting properly. The belts, we are going to want to have a look at the belt. Belts, if you buy OEM belts, can be very expensive. Oftentimes, you can manually pull on your secondary, and you can actually advance the belt to look at most of it. Uh, this belt's in great shape. I will show you what a uh, bad belt looks like. Belts fail in a couple of different ways. This belt is starting to lose its, uh, its fibers and its braiding. So we can say that this belt will need to be replaced. There's also some cracking starting in it. Um, you can also look for burn marks that will look similarly to this, but there'll be kind of like a, a round groove in it, and that could cause the sled to hop a little bit uh, at takeoff. But we know the sled uh, has a good belt in it, but we're gonna wanna definitely check for anything that uh, looks or resembles um, that right there. We have moved to the exhaust side now. We're going to be checking things out on the exhaust side. And we have our flashlight. Now, if you see anywhere in the belly pan a bunch of leaves or a bunch of pine needles or anything like that, you can kind of get a little bit of a history about the storage of your machine uh, that you're looking to buy. If this has been stored outside, chances are it's gonna be full of leaves and pine cones. Uh, that'll also fill up the running boards unless it's been stored uh, inside or cleaned out very well. We'll continue our visual check in here. We're just gonna have a look around at the boots and kind of see them as best we can for the intake. Nothing obvious. Uh, not no corrosion in this machine. And we're just gonna have a look for any wires that may be touching the exhaust, uh, maybe rubbing or pinched, but everything on this machine is pretty good. So this sled has had a few modifications done to it, mostly light stuff. This is a aftermarket exhaust, just the can. And we have done also a full belt drive kit in this because this originally comes with a chain case. So this looks a little bit 
different than what you'd be looking at at any other uh, M8, but it's similar to what you'd be looking at if you were getting a Polaris. Many Polaris, especially mountain sleds, have belt drive system. So what we're gonna be looking at here, and we'll hop over to the chain case on that M8 over there in a moment. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at them and I'll tell you what to look for on these belts. So generally when these belts start to wear out, um, they, don't, they don't actually wear out, they just start losing teeth. So the blue areas, and you can see the teeth on the, that belt, any of these right here, any of those teeth that are sticking out on the inside, you'll generally see those start to go missing. And that's how you'll know if that belt needs to be replaced. And these quick drive belts, if it were a Polaris, this is a TKI kit, these belts can be very expensive. Now this is generally what you're gonna be looking at here if you're looking at a Dew or something older or a uh, cat is a enclosed chain case. So we can look down here and we can actually see in that sight glass, the quality of the oil, the quality of the oil in this machine is basically brand new because I just changed it before the last ride. So we can see that that oil is very uh, clear. But unfortunately, in most cases, you're not gonna be able to really know what's going on inside that case until you open it up and look at it. So we will be continuing that test in our uh, test drive here in our run up. We are also going to check our fluids real quick. Uh, the oil tank, or sorry, the coolant tank on this happens to be right here. And we can see that it is full of coolant at the proper level. We can also see that the brake reservoir has a uh, brake fluid in it. On the other side on this machine, this is the main oil tank. Uh, this is an expendable, so you will have to fill this up. It's not like a four stroke. If it were a four stroke, you would see a dipstick on a offsite chamber or maybe directly on the motor, depending on the unit. So you'd wanna check the oil real quick uh, and check the quality if it were a four stroke, if this is a two stroke. So we just wanna make sure that there's oil in there and we can see that. All right, now the exciting part, finally, we are getting ready to start this snowmobile. So we're gonna check just a couple little things before we go ahead and start it, okay? First off, we're gonna make sure the throttle isn't sticking. So we're just going to make sure that the throttle is returning all the way to uh, a fully closed position. Polaris is classic for having stuck throttles. And we're just gonna make sure that when we start this thing, it's not gonna take off. We're just gonna make sure our kill switch is working. And we are gonna now get ready to start the unit. And we're gonna be doing some engine tests. But before we go ahead and do that, let's give this recoil rope a pull out. And we're going to just give it a quick inspection. So it is a little bit of fraying on it. Not too bad, pretty minor stuff, but if this was half run through or anything like that, you'd know we need to do a recoil rope really fast. Um, so let's, let's start it up. We're gonna be doing a few more things in the engine compartment afterward, but uh, let's go ahead and start this up. If it were electric start, we'd wanna check that. Uh, we'd probably do that first. And in this case, this does not have electric start. So we're just going to be giving it a pull. And you gotta make sure the key's on. So this sled is so loud that I can't give you the instructions while it's running. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut the sled off so I can give you all the instructions. You are going to want to make sure that all your controls are working here. So we have our brake. We're going to check the brake light in the back. When we pull in the brake, we're going to check all our gauge switches, our hand thumb warmers. These may take a few minutes to warm up your hand or thumb warmers, so be patient with them. Uh, this is our electric start button. It's also a, doubles as a reverse button. So you will want to make sure that uh, the reverse button works if it has reverse on other sleds in the gear case, which will be generally down here. On some cats, it's down there. Um, there will be a manual shifter and we wanna make sure that the reverse works. We are checking all the controls out right now. Um, we're gonna wanna make sure the kill switch works. If it has a tether, we are going to want to make sure that the tether works. Uh, the headlights, we're gonna wanna check out all of those. We wanna make sure that everything on the gauge is working. We wanna check out everything up here. At this point, we've determined that the sled starts and runs. We've determined that all the electrical work. Um, now what we're gonna do here is we're gonna check out the motor and this is going to be very easy. Um, 
we are going to do what is basically a poor man's compression test. Now on this specific uh, procedure, there's gonna be a lot of people who don't agree with me on here, but uh, I've, I've done the slots before. This was something that I would do at the shop sometimes. It doesn't hurt anything, it's not bad, but we don't wanna do it for uh, an extended period of time either, because the only thing that would happen is that we uh, would maybe foul a spark plug. So after the motor has ran a little bit, you don't wanna do this with a cold motor, um, but after the motor has ran a little bit, we are going to do this. I'm gonna show you how to do a poor man's compression test. Now on most sleds, you are going to have more than one cylinder. And this sled here is a twin, so it is no different. You can see both those spark plug caps on the top. And after the unit has ran just a little bit, just enough to kind of get warm and uh, get everything flowing, we are now going to unplug one of those uh, caps. So you can see we have this spark plug cap off of the spark plug. And now what we're gonna wanna do is we're going to start the unit. Do not unplug that spark plug while the unit is running. You will get zapped. I've done it before, believe me, you wanna make sure it's off. So what we're gonna wanna do here is we're gonna start it up again with only one spark plug cap uh, detached. So you can look at the spark plugs visually if, if that's something that you wanna do. Um, but we are going to now start it because this will run on one cylinder. That's all we wanted to do. We just wanted to make sure that that one cylinder was gonna carry the unit because they will run on one. We don't wanna run it long. We just wanna run it long enough that it'll fire and start and run. We wanna shut it off right away. So now that we've done that, we would want to plug the spark plug uh, cap back into the spark plug that we just took it off of and then we'd want to unplug the other spark plug and we'd want to repeat it. And then we'd want to know that that other cylinder on the other side, the one we hadn't tested, would do the exact same thing. We'd want to know that it's strong enough to carry the unit. We are now on pretty well the last step of this entire process. We are now going to either run up the unit if you can, or test drive it. If there's snow, test drive it. Um, but since there's no snow around right now and there's actually raining out, we are going to run up this unit on the stand behind me. We are gonna pretend right now that the sled is running because if I do it, if I, if I try to explain to you what's happening while this sled is running, you'll never hear me. So we're gonna pretend that this sled is running right now. So first off, we're gonna want to let this sled warm up. Let it sit there a few minutes, let it come up to temperature. And what we are going to do first off is after it's been running for a few minutes, we're gonna put our hand down on here. Now on this cat, that's not actually gonna do anything uh, because the heat exchanger is in the front. That's where your coolant runs through. Many sleds today on the market, most sleds are water cooled. So that is where the coolant circulates through. So you're gonna wanna make sure that that heat exchanger is getting warm because that means your coolant is circulating properly. If it were an air cooled unit, you would want to make sure that that fan is turning uh, to spin the fan blades while that unit is running. And you will feel on the exhaust side of the fan is a bunch of warm air coming out of the engine and that's what you want to feel it. The sled is now warm. If you cannot test drive it in the snow, we are now going to want to play with the throttle a little bit. We are going to want to bring it up, put a little bit of load on that engine and make sure it can take it. But we're not going to want to do this until that the engine is fully warm. Ideally, test driving it is the best because you can really put some load on that engine and you can bring it through its paces and you can really feel that the power is there and this is a strong running engine. But in this case, we're not able to do that. So we're gonna do the best best thing is set it up on the jack stand and we're gonna run it and we're going to look at the clutches and we're gonna make sure that they're shifting and we're gonna make sure that everything in here is proper on this unit. It is very smoky in there. If you um, go through all these steps that I just kind of described to you, you're gonna have a pretty good idea of what kind of sled you're gonna be getting. The last thing you really wanna do when you're buying a sled is 
make sure it's not stolen. If it's registered, like proof of registration, proof of insurance, that's great. If it's an old unit that's been on the farm forever, now, not a lot of farmers will actually register or insure their machines. So there may not actually be a paper trail on it. What you can do in Canada anyway, is you can actually take that VIN number from the unit. It's, you can check it. You can run it through a um, RCMP site and it will check that VIN number if it's reported stolen. And that's, that's, that's something important. Don't buy a stolen sled. That is up to you. If you start to see things like a VIN number that's been shaved right off, if it's missing a VIN number, that's a red flag. No matter how cool a sled is, if it doesn't have a VIN number on it, don't buy it. It's probably stolen. If there is a uh, plate with a VIN number that's been um, stamped onto it and then riveted onto the chassis, that does not mean it's stolen necessarily. That means it could be stolen if it was a theft recovery and that it was then revinned by uh, your local registry, which, which happens too. But these are things you want to think about uh, when you're picking up a sled. You don't want to buy something stolen because really it's unfortunate. Now you are in possession of stolen property. So what does that mean for you? We have gone through check stops in British Columbia going out to ride where um, the officers, they were only checking sledders and they were only checking for stolen sleds. And we talked to them. And of course, all other sleds are registered, insured, plated and all that crap. But when we talked to them, they said, yeah, it's we've been at it for about two hours today on this uh, Saturday morning and we've found seven stolen sleds so far. So there is a lot of them around. Don't buy one. Now it is still way too smoky in there for me to do my outro. So I will do it right here. Thanks everybody for watching this video. I hope this video helps. I hope that uh, it's concise enough, but um, open enough that most people can understand what I'm talking about and most people can make an informed buying choice because not everybody has a sled mechanic friend that they can just lean on to get a good snowmobile. So thanks everybody for watching. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. I will be sure to answer them. Um, if there's anything that you like to look for on a sled, uh, I'll make a list down in the description and we can add to that list as we go. But if you go through these steps, that's a pretty good start on what you're going to be getting. So thanks everybody for watching this video. If you like this video, uh, if you like said videos, there's all sorts of extreme playlists here and, and whatever. We like to snowmobile. So we will see everybody in the next video. Bye everybody.